came here today. Oh, no, no. That's okay. Do it in English. <laughs> Do it in English. We came here at 10 o'clock today to yeah. Forest. Yeah. And um, they did a Liberal Party, a European Liberal Party um, session about what the European Parliament can do for the climate. And so they invited both Martin and I, and we talked about, what, in particular, the climate Riksdagen, or the climate parliament that the Swedes are doing, which I would love to see Europe do a version of the climate parliament. Mm. When we could really do it in conclusion, now I'm really running on, but we could do it in conclusion close to the IPCC meeting in November, yeah. like two weeks before. And then we could push for, because study group three is very, very poor. Mm, okay. Right. So they need some strong citizen ideas to nudge them in the right direction. So we use the um, Robert, is it Richard Thalens nudging? Mm. We need to nudge parliamentarians in the right direction. And we need to also give them a little bit of climate shame. Yeah. Because they're not doing enough. You don't think so? Uh, the European Parliament is not doing enough no. for the climate. Absolutely not. The way, let's face it. Everybody over the age of 44 should feel shame. Because mm. in 92, the IPC made a scientific document which said we needed to change and technology would have been enough. Yeah. And we have not done that. Right. So as a voter... Oh, as an 18-year-old from 92, right. then I was old enough to make an impact at that point. So right. if I'm over, over 44, so 26 years, isn't it, plus 18, 40, if I'm over 44, then I actually have some, uh, what I would call, um, I, should be, I should have a climate gift to somebody who's under that age to help inspire them to do more because we have not done enough. Mm. And I think we have to accept that. That we and Kevin Anderson is really good the way as soon as he meets an audience, anybody who's under uh, a millennial, yeah, he apologizes. The first thing he does is he apologizes. We have failed you, right? Yeah, and you're laughing. No, I'm wondering what more no. you want me to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. You got so enthusiastic out there as well. <laughs> I did, and I did. Encouraging, okay. all right. That was uh, great. Do you want to know? Do you want to know yeah, my I want really? To know what okay, that's... I want to know what that was. All right. The, um, the way I see it is that when you look at a human being, you divide them into three categories. All of us have three categories. We're a business person, like a worker, or we own a business or both, or we're a consumer. Mm -hmm. And the third category we are is a citizen. Now, we need to take our citizenship more seriously, not as just as individuals, but as a society. Okay, And when we vote and put a person, give them our power for the next four years, we need to make sure that they take on that work for the common good, which is the climate. And if they don't, we need to be prepared to take action seriously. Okay, And this, uh, I actually, when I think about my life and you know, flying to Australia and back half a dozen times or more, marrying a Swede, you know, all these expensive things when it comes to the carbon dioxide. I, I feel enormous climate anxiety. And I, instead of taking that inwards into myself and um, being angry with myself and being uh, regretful for what I've done, I turn that out into climate action. And there's some really, really good science on climate action for individuals. It, it's, both, it's political action. It's not being silent anymore. It's, it doesn't need to be violent. I believe in completely non-violent, but it's about doing sit-ins. It's about making noise. It's about pushing them. And it's about saying, you are a politician. You either do what we want or you need to abdicate. I don't believe in four years is long enough anymore. We've only got two we have got effectively two voting sessions left yeah. for climate. And um, so if they're not doing what they promise, what they promised prior to within two years, I think they should be abdicated from our common view, common good perspective. Like it, we're passing this mess on to people in, uh, you know, look at, look at the children in daycare today. We're passing that mess to them. That's irresponsible. 
I, I, I get so angry yeah, when I think about angry. it. <laughs> you know what the best part of it is? <laughs> when you say flying back into forth to, to Australia a dozen times and marrying a Swede. Yeah. 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 That's well, your contribution to the climate crisis. That's a huge... No, that's a huge contribution to... Yeah. Yeah. I, I met my what wife... What was the worst part? Was it the flying back and forth to Australia or marrying a Swede? <laughs> Marrying the Swede was the best thing I ever did. <laughs> you made it sound like that's the catastrophe, <laughs> catastrophe for, for the climate. Marrying a Swede, that's the, probably the worst thing you can do when it comes to climate. No, but if you're in Australia yeah. and you married a Swede and then you create this connection which has a sort of psychological requirement of flying back and forth once a mm. year, even though I don't do that, um, it, that is um, a very difficult thing in your whole personal life than to match into your, what you're doing in your society. Yeah. Okay, so, and I, I, I'm, I did not just marry a Swede, he's great, but I married the Swedish culture. I adopted a culture. Mm. I actually should have probably liked your culture more than you like it, because I chose to be a Swede. Right. Yeah. And what is that compared to being Australian? Okay. Uh, like... It's very, very difficult to say what it is compared to be only an Australian, but because Australia is many cultures. But the key thing for me, because I grew up as a, um, I was born into an all-Catholic family, went to an all-Catholic school, hardly met a non-Catholic before the age of 12. Mm. Not one, really, okay? You've got to think, maybe the person across the milk bar when I bought milk, but that's it, okay? So it's a fairly segregated life yeah i went to all girls high school so when i did engineering i broke out of that world and finally met non-catholics okay so you're 18 you've hardly met a non-catholic yet okay and then you're marrying a sweet yeah so I'll, i'll tell you a story now i'm really getting long so you're gonna have to cut all this and put it into pieces <laughs> my father when i was 20 he said to me janine if you just married a, a catholic then all so many decisions would be made Uh, you'd know which schools to send your children to. You'd know um, where to, who to have your social contacts with, wh- what to do with your life. And then when I'm 25, he said, Janine, if you just married an Australian, at least you'd know which country to live in. <laughs> <laughs> And being a Catholic, he sees that I'm his bird until he marries me, you okay. see. Okay, so when I'm 30, he says, Janine, just get married. <laughs> Whereas this independent woman view of not needing to... What, who cares about men? I just want to get on with my career. Right. Was not... You know, that was like, what are you talking about, Dad? But eventually I had to get married at 31 to a non-Catholic, non, um, non-Australian. And, but also I married a culture. I married the Swedish culture, which was far more... Women were treated as far more equals. Not perfectly, but still as far more equals. Uh, you were given the infrastructure to live your life independently and that it's trivial things like the bikeways and taking the the tunnel barner and the doors open so if you're carrying bags you don't need a a guy to stand by Mm. you know (laughs) it's a a, a guttural sound about men always me having to make way for women and I do like the chivalry I, I like men opening doors for me but I also understand that I don't really want it you know what I mean it's sort of like this double feeling being a woman without being a woman Um, anyway now we've really got an off subject so we keep on going what do I love about Sweden I love the the democracy here yeah the Australian system has two parties and it's only one of those two parties to get in Mm. and I don't know if you know the constitutional system of most of the English world so the British the Canadians the Americans and us where because of the small constitutional areas, it's one of these two parties. So, for example, in America, you'll only ever really get the Republicans or the Democrats, yeah. which actually means, from a marketing perspective, that they're very close to each other right. rather than having diversity of ideas. So you never get change in a society, whereas the Swedish system, which has eight different, you know, the dif- distance between uh, Sveria Demokraterna to the left is mm. enormous mm. and so you can actually begin to discuss ideas. Whereas in, and that's also a part of the Australian system, is the media is dominated by um, one. In mm. Australia it's been dominated by one owner. Mm. For well, ev- you don't get much change if everyone is 
centred in the in the middle. Somewhere. But not just that. The media is owned in a dominant and way by Murdoch. Oh. Okay, and has been since I was a voter. Hmm. So I came to Sweden and I began to find out news news articles about my own country and was a bit surprised. <laughs> 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 You had to go pretty far to find out something about your own country. <laughs> and then I began to read about the Swedish society. 365 different companies owning media organisations. I was in shock. Yeah. And then gradually as I learned Swedish, I began to actually read opinions. Mm. And, you know, it, be- it was like an opening of the door, like of information and knowledge. Whereas the Australian society, where you basically... Uh, Murdoch... It, it, my best way to explain the Murdoch situation is that Assange mm. is his opposite. Mm. Because Murdoch closes the system down to less and less information or less and less breadth, yeah. which is a natural businessman's proposal. A monopoly person does that. So, but Whereas Assange is like trying to crack that open as much as possible, yeah. news from anywhere, as long as he's certain that it's true, he'll put it up, right? So it's sort of like the... Uh, they're like yin and yang of each other, right, okay? One of them has a little bit of good and a lot of evil and the other one has a lot of good and a little bit of evil and both of it's, it's, it's about power. Yeah. Yeah, and we need to discuss power yeah. if we're going to fix the climate, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but this is yeah, I can't hold this any longer. <laughs> <laughs> Should I put it in the shelf or something <laughs> like that? Okay. You can turn it off and restart if you want and we can sit uh. down. <laughs> 